Hello, I'm Helen Scott and I'm going to talk to you today about the impact of the First World War on children's books written between the war, Mindscapes. The First World War left Britain in a state of collective trauma. Mindscapes of the writer's experience, together with tropes offering safety and reassurance to the traumatised children, are encoded into the books written between the wars, many of which remain in print today. The war was closer to home and more violent than ever before. This created mindscapes, mental images which would not go away, not only in the minds of the men and women fighting on the front lines, but also in the minds of those left behind. Airships dropped more than 5,000 bombs on British towns. Fighting could be heard in the home counties. London was 70 miles from the trenches, so soldiers could travel there and back again on the peacetime ferries bringing the horrors of war with them, says Paul Fussell in 2013, page 69. The wounded, physically and emotionally, returned to Blighty for treatment. Peter Lease states that shell shock was not well recognised post-war. Sir John Collier at the Ministry of Pensions called it malingering, less costly to the government pension scheme, 1997, page 1062. However, it was at least acknowledged whilst trauma in the men, women and children left at home was not. Working in the 1940s, John Balby's research into mourning and childhood separation anxiety found that the war children were significantly impacted with lasting trauma, says New Human Learner in 1982, page 11. Freud's work on adult neurosis, which began with investigations into shell shock, found the problems of adulthood rooted in childhood, and post-war children and adults with the same level of anxiety says Roper in 2014. This trauma was further impacted by a strong sense of disillusionment. Men went to war fighting for a pastoral vision of Britain emblazoned over the recruitment posters and carrying notions of innocence and purity. Pastoral images, says Andrew Etten, quote, link us to our earliest, purest and most natural condition and to the protected way of life that we imagine we remember from our own childhood, end quote, 1984, page 45. During the war, pastoralism denoted a peacetime Britain. Paul Fussell notes that the men in the trenches read pastoral writers with the complete works of Hardy outselling the more jingoistic Kipling. I didn't want to die, not before I'd finished The Return of the Native anyhow, said Siegfried Sassoon Fussell in page 177. This pastoral landscape was blown to pieces by the war. Returning servicemen who had fought for these pastoral mindscapes found they were not a reality. Lloyd George's Liberal Conservative Election Manifesto of 1918 promised a land fit for heroes, but an initial boon gave way to slump, particularly in the rural economy, with mass unemployment, lack of housing and insufficient pension schemes, says Fiona Reynolds in 2017, pages 34 to 5. The war began the shift in social hierarchies too, Women found their place in the workforce, class divisions began eroding, with a coming together in the trenches and the air raid shelters. John Ray Townsend tells us, psychological effect of the war was immense, and the effect was deeply felt in children's literature as elsewhere. End quote. 1965, page 163. From the Renaissance, the pastoral tradition in children's books linked notions of what it meant to be British to tropes of Eden. The Edenic myth involves good versus evil, innocence versus the fool, safety versus danger, couched in terms of gardens versus wilderness. John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, published in 1676, was set in recognisably British landscapes, suggesting that pilgrims, the British, would survive the journey, gain salvation, to the celestial city, London and heaven, if they trusted in God. If Eden was Britain, then the British were good and innocent, and Britain was the safe space. Books such as Francis Hodgson Burnett's The Secret Garden, written in 1911, were infused with innocence, healing and regrowth through pastoral landscapes. Alongside sat the Robinsonard adventures, in which the protagonist, says Ian Kinane, exemplified, quote, the right way of British living, end quote, hard work, self-reliance, self-discipline and a spirit of intrepid adventure all of which combined to give an assurance of superiority, 2019, page 7. 
The aim of these books was to create, quote, the willing and devoted agent of empire, end quote, to fuel British industrialism, says Matthew Gremby in 2008, page 102. In the works of Ryder Haggard and Kipling, British children adventured in empire, their readers secure in the knowledge that they would get home safely in the end. In the period between the wars, children took comfort in school and adventure stories, which positioned the war as a just and necessary fight. These have not lasted the course of time. However, there was also a change in writing for children. In a 1924 article for Nation, Hugh Lofting, author of the Dr. Doolittle stories, draws attention to the impact that the traditional Imperia adventure stories had on children. Quote, the boy may not have heard his father boasting of the glories of a crack regiment, but he has read a whole heap of so-called children's classics in which highly painted heroes galloped glorious and victorious across bloody battlefields. That kind of battlefield has gone for good. It is still bloody, but you don't gallop. And since that kind of battlefield has gone, that kind of book for children should go too. Quoted in Schmidt, 1992, page 10. Lofting fought with the Irish Guards on the Western Front, invalided home in 1918. The Doolittle stories began as letters home to his children. His particular mindscape was the treatment of horses. Whilst hospital clearing stations were available for wounded men, wounded or exhausted animals were simply shot. In his biography of Hugh Lofting, Gary Schmidt describes a man who saw writing as a political and moral task. That's the introduction, page 12. In Doolittle, Lofting creates a man who talks to animals in a fair and peaceful world, illustrating equality and cooperation to generations of young readers. Whilst traditionally children's book protagonists went in search of fortune, Doolittle's quest is to heal sick monkeys. Attitudes of intergovernment collaboration and benevolence are modelled. Doolittle defends a small tribe of Indians, choosing to conclude a peace treaty rather than punishing the aggressor, in The Voyages of Dr Doolittle, written in 1922. This was possibly a veiled criticism of the punitive Treaty of Versailles. The animal kingdom's cooperation is, suggests Lofting, preferable to the conflict in the human world. By keeping the setting constant and recognisable, Lofting offered traumatised children security. The story of Dr Doolittle, written in 1920, begins and ends in Puddled Beyond the Marsh, a recognisable British village complete with British weather and British flowers. The descriptions of African jungle read like a geography textbook, although Lofting had spent some time living in Africa. A sense of place is given by palm trees, fruits and vegetables and tobacco. On the voyage home, Doolittle stops at the Canary Islands, a key colonial trading point recognisable to schoolchildren at the time. Schmidt suggests that the Doolittle stories are, quote, endowed with a therapeutic role aimed principally at himself and a generation of children, end quote. The very nature of children's literature liberates the author to, quote, experience therapeutic release without anxieties over the scrutiny of an adult psycho psychoanalytical critique, says Hamida Bosmarjian, because the implied reader is a child and therefore, quote, highly unreliable, end quote. That's Bosmarjian in 2005, page 103. Gillian Avery confirms this power imbalance, stating that children's books are written and bought by adults to educate the next generation. Quote, At any given period, you find what parents and teachers desired for children, their concepts of the ideal child and the thoughts they sought to connect. End quote. It's 1989, page 95. Children's books written between the wars were, says Peter Hunt, quote, characterised by a desire to protect children from the horrors of war, end quote, which writers such as Lofting and Milne had seen firsthand. That's 2016, page 327. However, Clementine Bouvet in 2015 argues that children have an unseen future not dictated by adults. Whilst writers of children's books deliberately encode safety, Bouvet's mighty child might find more than this. A. A. Milne also recognised the war as traumatic for children. Nadia Cohen, in her biography of Milne, says Milne, quote, never fully recovered from the horror and inhumanity he endured on the battlefields of the Somme, which left him a changed man. The memories haunted him forever, end quote. 2017, page 39. The poems in When We Were Very Young, written in 1924, 
and Now We Are Six in 1927, are often criticised for being twee and nostalgic. However, When We Were Very Young is dark, filled with foreboding. Rather, it is E.H. Shepard's images which hark back to the pastoral, the pre-war child in nature. In his poems, Milne developed Robert Louis Stevenson's pioneering representation of individual childhood anxieties, says Gremby in 2014, page 49, with the war's influence never very far away. There are missing parents and disobedience. James James Morrison's mother hasn't been heard of since. Missing children in before tea. Displacement is dealt with in halfway down the stairs, where the child wants, would rather be halfway down the stairs, which isn't really anywhere, it's somewhere else instead. The war led to a shift in the role of children in British society and notions as to how they perceived themselves. In the pastoral tradition, a child's imagination was traditionally perceived as a garden. But in The Wrong House, Milne writes about a house which hasn't got a garden, and nobody listens to the blackbird singing. If I were a king, finds a child straining against the need to be good all the time, whilst in politeness the child is happy to be polite, but wishes he didn't have to be. The certainties of childhood, of innocence in nature, as previously found in children's books, is thrown off balance. A more direct mindscape is found in The Invaders. The invaders come one by one in ordered silence. Some blackbirds are on an outpost you. Look at how a different illustration can change the film of the feel of the poem. In careless patches through the wood the clumps of yellow primrose stood, and sheets of white anemones like driven snow against the trees had covered up the violet, but left the bluebell bluer yet. Along the narrow carpet ride with primroses on either side, between their shadows and the sun, the cows came slowly, one by one, breathing in the morning air and leaving it still sweeter there. And one by one, intent upon their purposes, they followed on in ordered silence and were gone. But all the little wood was still, as if it waited so, until some blackbird on an outpost yew, watching the slow procession through, lifted his yellow beak at last to whistle that the line had passed. Then all the wood began to sing in morning anthem to the spring. This seems to be less twee nostalgia, and more in the vein of war poetry embedded into the pastoral. Henry Williamson, author of Tarka the Otter, became a writer during the war after writing his experiences to aid recovery from psychological trauma. In a British Library blog, Anne Williamson suggests that Tarka is an allegory of Henry Williamson's war experiences, questioning the unnecessary killing and loss of humanity, quote, a subconscious process of therapeutic discharge and healing, end quote. There is certainly evidence that Williamson remained traumatised by the war. In 1929, his paper, The Realities of War, begins by describing how quickly he reverts into his war mindscapes. A motor car, suddenly slowing down in the asphalt roadway down below my open window in Hove, made a downward droning sound, and instantly the sunlight on my paper was put out, and I was in deep, sucking mud. That's from the Henry Williamson Society webpage. In the same paper he describes the death of his colleague, then a stricken mule reared up and sagged and broke, and under it driver Frith was pressed into the slough. This bears significant likeness to the ending of Tarka, notes the Henry Williamson website. They saw the broken head look up, and then the hound was sinking with the otter into the deep water, and as they watched, another bubble shook to the surface and broke. Even more in other drafts of this paper, was pressed is changed to sank, making the similarity feel even more deliberate. If that is so, then reading the story of Tarka as a war allegory becomes simple, Hunting scenes mimic battles with attack and counterattack, the chase and then the lull. Commands are sent down the line by the generals or the uniformed huntsmen. The recognisably Dorset landscape is filled with mud, ditches or trenches, skulls. There are warning shots, the cries of the birds and the confusion of the chase. This is closely observed nature writing in which Williamson compares the animal world's need for survival with the lack of humanity seen in the war and he finds the animal world's need for survival infinitely preferable.
As the years progressed, the trauma experienced by writers who had been involved in the war remained still encoded into their books. Beneath the text of Wurzel Gummidge, published in 1936, are images which appear to come directly from Barbara Youth and Todd's experiences as a VAD worker during the war. For example, mud, redolent of the Somme, is so sticky that, quote, one of John's boots came right off. When he tried to push his foot into it again, the boot sank deeper and deeper into the sticky soil, and when he stood on one leg and pulled, he tumbled over. The descriptions of the unconscious scarecrow before he turns human are similar to descriptions of the wounds caused by the flying, burning metal of shell attacks. These left many war veterans so badly scarred they wore face masks, prompting the development of plastic surgery. Oh, cried Susan, he's got an umbrella. He's holding it in his, his... She looked more closely and saw that the scarecrow hadn't got a hand. And his nose was just a novel and his mouth only a slit. Norman Lease finds parity between Norman Fenton's search into shell shock in American soldiers and the British situation. Of the normal cases, about 39% of those surveyed, Fenton found that they were liable to violent outbursts and unpredictable behaviour for the rest of their lives. This unpredictable behaviour can be seen in the scarecrow who sulks. Quote, sometimes I sulks for hours and sometimes I sulks for weeks. End quote. Similarly, quote, he looked like someone who was unhappy but trying to be cheerful. End quote. Although Wurzel Gummidge was first published 18 years after the war finished, the trauma of living with shell shock did not go away. The changing world of childhood is also a concern in Wurzel Gummidge, noting the erosion of the divide between childhood and adulthood. When John begs him to tell him about when he was little, Gummidge replies, quote, I never was little. We stayed the size we're made and were made to fit our clothes, tis only sense. End quote. When he asks how he turns from scarecrow to human scarecrow, he doesn't know and explains, quote, Your sort turns into men, but you don't know how you does it. Eggs turn into chickens, apples turns to dumplings, milk turns to cheese. None of them know how they does it. It's a changeable world. Severe psychological trauma resulting from the war left mindscapes which inspired art and literature. Interestingly, all the books mentioned here remain in print and part of popular culture a hundred years later. Updated to lose some of their 1920s ideologies, Dr Doolittle has inspired TV, films, theatre, gaming. When We Were Very Young is one of the best-selling books of all time, with sales in their millions. Tarka the Otter won the Hawthorne Award on publication and has been made into multiple films. Wurzel Gummidge inspired the 1970s TV series with John Pertwee and has more recently been reimagined by Mackenzie Crook for the BBC. The originals of all these books are based on white, middle-class British children whose families have nannies and servants. Whilst otter hunting was a popular sport in the 1920s, today the otters are gone, as are the charcoal burners, hedge layers and a myriad of the other rural occupations included in these stories. Talking animals and scarecrows were always fantasy, but wandering free in the countryside, which was a norm for children between the wars, is certainly a fantasy now. There seems little of relevance to children of the 21st century. While some see these books as a yearning for the past, a nostalgic desire for a perception of innocence, they were written at a time of deep despair and trauma, when childhood was being reconsidered as were the books being written for childhood. Swirling beneath the texts lies the trauma of the adult writer and the perceived trauma of the implied readers. New ways of writing sought to reassure the child and indeed the adult. Gone was the perception that the child was innocent in nature. The First World War turned out not to be the war to end all wars but merely the start of global discombobulation as empires fell apart and the world struggled to find a new social order, as we still are today. Beauvais' mighty child finds comfort not only in the deliberate topes of safety and reassurance which seem to have been encoded into the books written between the wars, but also in the recognition that childhood is a troubled time. By acknowledging that trauma, in the safety of the pastoral landscape, the known settings, these books have gained a resonance which keeps them at the forefront 
of popular culture today.